And we're going to lead off with our chalice lighting. No, Richard is going to introduce us. Welcome, everybody, to the third Wednesday Vesper service of the UU Multiracial Unity Action Council. I'm Richard Trudeau. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Matthew Shear, and his sermon title is The Arsenal of Democracy. We'll now light our chalice. Richard will light it while I recite these words. May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, spirit of freedom. And now uh, I'm going, there he is, and I'm going to, uh, open our opening hymn, uh, number 358 in the gray hymnal, which you're welcome to sing along to muted. It's uh, rank by rank, again we stand, and I'm going to screen share the lyrics over the music that I will play. So let's see if this, if we can do this. And what the hell? <laughs> uh, okay, let's see if I can do this. Let's start this up um, here. Our next service will be April 17th, 2024. Uh, so far, we don't know who the preacher is or who what the sermon title will be, but there, there will be a preacher and there will be a sermon. And uh, if you got the link for this from this email address, you'll get one next time too. But if it's been forwarded to you by someone, you should uh, just send an email to that address and you'll get on the list. All our past services are on YouTube, 
if you go to the UMIAC homepage, umiac.org, and scroll down, there's a link called Third Wednesday Services. Uh, on April 13th, uh, the UU Multiracial Unity Action Council is having a, a convocation. This is Saturday, April 13th, uh, noon central time. We're, we're headquartered in Chicago, so I give central time first. So that's one o'clock Eastern, noon central, 11 Mountain, 10 Pacific. Uh, it's about white privilege, that concept. Uh, it's good and bad effects. Um, it's a, a basically um, valid term, but that can be have all kinds of bad effects. But uh, we want to change the conversation and look at it in a positive way. And uh, the presenters will be Dr. Ken Christensen and myself. Uh, to register, send an email, not to Richard Three Point, but to umiac at gmail, and we'll send you a Zoom code uh, the day before on Friday. It's the mission of the UU Multiracial Unity Action Council to carry out and foster anti-racist and multiracial unity activities, both within and outside the Unitarian Universalist Association through education, bearing witness and other actions and expansion of our membership, both within and outside the walls of our congregations. We also seek to defend our UU principles against those such as most of our national leaders who seek to undermine them. We envision our congregations, denomination, and society as not being color blind, but color appreciative, as judging and treating members of the world's rank and file by the content of their character, not the color of their skin or their cultural heritage, and as treasuring diversity in the context of the beloved community. We call this vision multiracial Unitarian Universalism. This is the prize, this is the goal, this is the mountaintop, the unity of the light and dark-skinned people of the world. Tonight, I hope to uh, demonstrate that liberal religious values, as expressed in our seven UU principles, are those which have guided this country through key moments in its history, from the revolution through the Civil War, and led us as a country to fight the good fight against fascism. I also hope to show how today's challenges echo those from the past and call for a similar response. And I want to make clear at the outset that we are all for liberation. The difference is that our adherence to the fourth principle of a free and responsible search for truth leads us to think about these things and then act on that knowledge. Now, I was inspired to create this service after reading two recent books. Uh, I can put these in the chat later. Or uh, One is Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America by NPR reporter Steve Inskeep. And the other is Prequel, uh, An American Fight Against Fascism by Rachel Maddow. Now, the first has something to say about what it takes to unify on an issue of liberation in a way that makes it politically feasible. The second warns us of how easy it is for the enemies of freedom to divide us and to prevent us from doing just that. The authors of each make clear that they wrote their books because what happened then is happening now. And as I thought about this, I thought of a phrase from the time that Rachel Maddow writes about, though it does not appear in her book, the arsenal of democracy. Many of us know it from a radio speech given by Franklin Delano Roosevelt on December 29, 1940. Having just won re-election, he now felt more free to press the case for sending aid to a belegu beleaguered Britain against the isolationist sentiment that was being propagandized and promoted by the Nazis that Maddow fills her book detailing. And I'm going to read 
some excerpts from that speech. Uh, so this, these are Franklin Delano Roosevelt's words. This is not a fireside chat on war. It is a talk on national security because the nub of the whole purpose of your president is to keep you now and your children later and your grandchildren much later out of a last ditch war for the preservation of American independence and all the things that American independence means to you and to me and to ours. We face this new crisis, this new threat to the security of our nation with the same courage and realism that we solved the financial crisis in 1933. Never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock has our American civilization been in such danger as now. For on September 27, 1940, this year, by an agreement signed in Berlin, three powerful nations, two in Europe and one in Asia, joined themselves together in the threat that if the United States of America interfered with or blocked the expansion program of these three nations, a program aimed at world control, they would unite in ultimate action against the United States. The Nazi masters in Germany have made it clear that they intend not only to dominate all life and thought in their own country, but also to enslave the whole of Europe and then to use the resources of Europe to dominate the rest of the world. It was only three weeks ago that their leader stated this, there are two worlds that stand opposed to each other. And then, in defiant reply to his opponents, he said this, Others are correct when they say, With this world we cannot ever reconcile ourselves. I can beat any other power in the world. So said the leader of the Nazis. In other words, the Axis not merely admits, but the Axis proclaims that there can be no ultimate peace between their philosophy their philosophy of government and our philosophy of government. In view of the nature of this undeniable threat, it can be asserted properly and categorically that the United States has no right or reason to encourage talk of peace until the day shall come when there is a clear intention on the part of the aggressor or nations to abandon all thought of dominating or conquering the world. At this moment, the forces of the, of the states that are leagued against all the peoples who live in freedom are being held away from our shores. The Germans and the Italians are being blocked on the other side of the Atlantic by the British and by the Greeks and by thousands of soldiers and sailors who were able to escape from subjugated countries. In Asia, the Japanese are being engaged by the Chinese nation in another great defense. In the Pacific Ocean is our fleet. The history of recent years proves that the short shootings and the chains and the concentration camps are not simply the transient tools, but the very altars of modern dictatorships. They may talk of a new order in the, he didn't actually use air quotes, um, new order in the world, but what they have in mind is only a revival of the oldest and worst tyranny in that there is no liberty, no religion, no hope. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. We must apply ourselves to our task with the same resolution, the same sense of urgency, the same spirit of patriotism and sacrifice as we would show were we at war. We have no excuse for defeatism. We have every good reason for hope, hope for peace, hope for the defense of our civilization, and for the building of a better civilization in the future. I have the profound conviction that the American people are now determined to put forth a mightier effort than they have ever yet made to increase our production of all the implements of defense to meet the threat to our democratic faith. As President of the United States, I call for that national effort. I call for it in the name of this nation which we love and honor and which we are privileged and proud to serve. I call upon our people with absolute confidence that our common cause will greatly succeed. Now, let us enter into a time of prayer and meditation. What follows is an unusual form of prayer, but I have found it as moving as any prayer I've 
I've ever spoken or read, and I hope you'll agree. It is a short scene from the 1942 movie Casablanca. The action takes place around the time as Roosevelt's Arsenal of Democracy speech. The movie opens with this narration. With the coming of the Second World War, many eyes in imprisoned Europe turned, hopefully or desperately, toward the freedom of the Americas. One, then now, I would tell you that one such person seeking to get to America is Victor Laszlo, a Czech who is a leader of the resistance against the Nazis, first in his country, then in France. He escaped from a concentration camp and realizes that he can be most effective in continuing his work in the freedom that America offers. Like many, he's made his way to Casablanca in what was then called Free France, though the Vichy government worked closely with the Nazis. Their lead, the Nazi leader in Casablanca is Major Strasser, who says to him, Victor Laszlo, he says, Herr Laszlo, you have a reputation for eloquence, which I now can understand. But in one respect, you are mistaken. You said the enemies of the Reich could all be replaced, but there is one exception. No one could take your place in the event anything unfortunate should happen to you while you are trying to escape. Laszlo finds his way to Rick's Café American, where he says to Rick, played by Humphrey Bogart, an expatriate America, says, you know it is very important that I must get out of Casablanca. It's my privilege to be one of the leaders of a great movement. You know what I've been doing. You know what it means to the work, to the lives of thousands of people, that I be free to reach America and continue my work. So here's that epic scene where these two ideas clash. And after that, we'll have a few minutes of silence. And I have to screen share before I do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't hit the share button, sorry. So those last words you heard were vive la democracy. And, uh, and so that is the topic here and the power of our ideals. So on 
November 19, 1863, Abraham Lincoln de delivered a short address at the dedication of a new military cemetery in Gettysburg four months after the epic battle that had taken place there over the July 4th uh, weekend that same year. And he began with, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now that story is told in another book, one that came out three years ago. It's called First Principles by Thomas Ricks, and it covers, as its subtitle says, what America's founders learned from the Greeks and Romans and how that shaped our country. But it also shows how their educations were also shaped by the liberal ideals of the Scottish Enlightenment. And I would say that those are also those ideals that have shaped the development of Unitarianism and Universalism and later Unitarian Universalism. In, in looking at this history of the American Revolution and the establishment of our Constitution, what I saw was that while most of the founders did not call themselves either Unitarian or Universalist, they acted within a range of ideas that we who use of today would recognize. Jefferson wrote about the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. James Madison, who took the lead in drafting and helping ratify the Constitution, including the preamble, which said, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Uh, to me, that sounds a lot like our principles. And the government that they set up under the Constitution was designed to be run by people who practiced what they called public virtue. John Adams put it this way in a letter he wrote in 1776 to his friend Mercy Otis Warren as the Continental Congress was preparing to endorse Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. He wrote, public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private, and public virtue is the only foundation of republics. There must be a positive passion for the public good, the public interest, honor, power and glory established in the minds of the people or there can be no Republican government nor any real liberty and this public passion must be superior to all private passions. Three years later as he com commanded the Continental Army during the War for Independence George Washington wrote to Mercy Warren's husband James Warren he said unless we can return a little more to first principles and act a little more upon patriotic ground, I do not know what may be the issue of this contest. Well, that all sounds, again, pretty UU-ish to me. But the story of how our liberal UU values are part of the DNA of this country doesn't stop there. In Differ We Must, Steve Inskeep notes that Lincoln grew up unchurched. But to me, he nevertheless seems to have adopted many of those first principles as evidenced by his Gettysburg Address. For example, when he concluded his short remarks by saying, that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth, he was citing Theodore Parker, who, quote, made common use of the phrase, quote, a democracy of all the people, by all the people, for all the people, in his letters and writing. But Lincoln parted company with Parker and other abolitionists over their tactics. And Inskeep sees this as relevant to what Lincoln accomplished, both in becoming president and then while he was president. Quoting from the book's introduction, Abraham Lincoln was a politician. Lincoln preserved the country and took part in a social revolution because he engaged in politics. He did the work others found dirty and beneath them. He always considered slavery wrong, but he felt immediate abolition was beyond the federal government's constitutional power and against the wishes of too many voters. So he tried to contain slavery. He helped build a democratic coalition supporting that position and held to it even when threatened with disunion and civil war. Lincoln learned, adapted, and sought advantage while interacting with people who disagreed with him. 
This book's title comes from an 1855 letter Lincoln sent to his best friend, Joshua Speed, who came from a slaveholding family. Quote, if for this you and I must differ, differ we must, ending quote. Yet he didn't abandon Speed, signing off as your friend forever. Lincoln rarely wrote people off because he knew that they had the power of the vote. It's not that Lincoln greatly changed his critics' belief, some went to war against him, nor that they greatly changed his. Rather, he learned how to make his beliefs actionable. He started his career in the minority party and set out to make a majority. He perceived a social problem so vast it seemed impossible to address, and he slowly found ways to address it. Lincoln's understanding, this is me speaking now, Lincoln's understanding that beliefs must be made actionable reminds me of 20th century theologian and Unitarian minister James Luther Adams, who wrote that to be effective, liberalism, quote, recognizes not only the power of thought, but also the power of organization and the organization of power. The faith of the liberal must express itself in societal forms, in the forms of education and in economic and social organization, in political organization. Without these, freedom and justice in community are impossible. The faith of a church or of a nation is an adequate faith only when it inspires and enables people to give of their time and energy to shape the various institutions, social, economic, and political of the common life. In following Lincoln's progress in building a viable Republican Party, Steve Inskeep writes, a few abolitionists spoke clearly but were called extremists. Lincoln himself considered abolitionists counterproductive. He was distressed when Henry Clay ran for president, only to be derailed by an anti-slavery third party. Clay would have won had he received the electoral votes of New York, but the Liberty Party candidate drained just enough of his support there to leave him 5,000 votes short. Yet Lincoln was able to make an ally of one such extremist, Owen Lovejoy, even though, quote, he, Lovejoy that is, was a living example of why even political leaders who opposed slavery commonly rejected abolitionists. His beliefs led him from a narrow critique of slavery to a broad attack on the entire power structure. Now, on the other hand, in an 1856 speech, Lincoln said he was ready to fuse with anyone who would unite with him to oppose the slave power. Inskeep writes, this was the message of unity Republicans needed. Lincoln said Republicans should defy this threat of succession. Link, he said, the union must be preserved in the purity of its principles as well as in the integrity of its territorial parts. The union must stand for something. Now, I would say, ready to fuse with anyone, describes how I feel about the religious resistance here in Unitarian Universalism in asserting the primacy of the idea that Unitarian Universalism must stand for the purity of its principles. Now, Lincoln also made an ally of one of the leading social conservatives of his day, an anti-immigrant nativist named Joseph Gillespie. This was necessary for when he challenged Stephen Douglas for the U.S. Senate seat in 1858. Uh, it was a time when senators were elected by the state legislature rather than by direct vote. So his campaign in Illinois had to be waged by winning each district this is similar to the way that presidential candidates must win across the country, especially in swing states due to the Electoral College. So he made allies in every district, whether they were uh, extreme left as Lovejoy or in the south of the state with a nativist like Gillespie. And we know Lincoln failed to win that Senate race, but went on to win the presidency just two years later. But even then, he tried to bridge the gap over slavery with the South in his first inaugural speech, as we heard earlier, and again four years later in his second inaugural speech, as victory seemed more likely in the Civil War. He said, let us judge not that we be judged, with malice toward none, with charity for all, 
Let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wound, wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Now, in my opinion, that's a far cry from what today's extremists in the UUA are preaching. Rather than speak to Lincoln's better angels of our nature as individuals and a society, they invoke a new Puritanism that our, our founders rejected in establishing this nation, and which Lincoln rejected in ending slavery by harnessing the power of government rather than condemning it. Though their, le their legacy in is in America, the founders and Lincoln and Roosevelt, their legacy is an America that is widely seen in the world as the land of democracy, of freedom, and of the American dream of doing better than what came before. It is recognized everywhere through such symbols as the Statue of Liberty and the words that Emma, Emma Lazarus that have been added to it. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And that's a problem for dictators who are not interested in the consent of the governed. And that's the subject of Rachel Maddow's book, Prequel. It, it goes into great detail about how almost immediately after taking power in Germany, the Nazis began propagandizing this country and funding those persons in and out of government who would divide us and keep us from helping other countries, especially Great Britain, resist conquest. She writes, Propaganda helped us to power, Joseph Goebbels announced at the Nazi Party Congress in 1936. Propaganda kept us in power. Propaganda will help us conquer the world. Hitler explained the plan in typically blunt terms. Our strategy is to destroy the enemy from within, to conquer him through himself. It is astonishing to me to read just how successful this campaign was, enough to keep Roosevelt from being able to help Churchill to the degree that he knew was necessary uh, to, to, for, for Britain to survive just in order to win the re-election in 1940. So Maddow goes on to say, in the years leading up to the U.S. entry in World War II, the American government, American institutions, and American democracy itself was under attack from enemies without and within. The great American fight against fascism that we have inherited as a cornerstone in our country's moral foundation is a fight that didn't happen only overseas in 1940. Americans fought on both sides of that divide here at home to, and their stories will curl your hair. The fight here at home in the 1930s and 1940s is a story of American politics at the edge, a violent ultra-right authoritarian movement weirdly infatuated with foreign dictatorships with plans to overthrow the U.S. government. Their attacks would spark chaos and panic, they hoped, and galvanize and radicalize anti-Roosevelt Americans, culminating in an armed takeover of the U.S. government and the installation of something much more like a fascist dictatorship. Roosevelt recognized this threat in his arsenal of democracy speech. He said, let us no longer blind ourselves to the undeniable fact that evil forces, that the evil forces which have crushed and undermined and corrupted so many others are already within our own gates. It is no coincidence that Steve Inskeep's book on Lincoln and Rachel Maddow's book on Nazi influence have come out now. More and more people are recognizing that the country is as divided now as it was in Lincoln's time. And perhaps Maddow's book will help more of us see the degree to which we are once again being propagandized by a dictator, in this case, Vladimir Putin in Russia, who's following the Nazi playbook almost exactly. Propaganda peddled by well-funded key figures in popular media and in government that would divide us rather than unite us and keep us from assisting democracy at home and democracies under threat overseas. That's because now as then, there is a recognition that the most potent weapon in our arsenal democracy is the power of our American ideals. Bullets, bombs, and rockets only become necessary when we forget that it's those ideals that made us the most powerful nation on the planet, one that other nations turn to when their freedom of democracy is threatened. 
These ideals have transcended party lines for much of our history, and we can restore this political balance by putting into government people who are steeped in this public virtue of the founders and into both political parties, and which may ensure that the future, in the future the weapons of war will give way to the weapons of peace, such as we saw with the Marshall Plan after World War II and JFK's Peace Corps. Our religious forebears were small in number, but had an outsized influence on moving the nation forward toward a more liberal expression of democracy. Now as then, it shouldn't matter as much what our leaders call themselves. I, as long as I suggest that it is religious religion, it is the principles of liberal religion that they put into government. As and I feel that they are wonderfully expressed in those UU principles that we in the religious resistance are working as hard as Victor Laszlo to preserve. They will succeed in guiding our nation to continue being a leader in what our sixth principle calls the, calls the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Mm. And uh, I will now see if I can screen share our closing hymn, We Would Be One. And, 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 uh, one moment, please, this guy, and then here, and, well, I think this is it. with this benediction just a minute just a minute oh, oh sorry the offering i beg never you. never forget the offering i had it after this but fine let's do it now okay um check us out will you our website is umiac.org we uh we feel that the what the uua leaders call anti-racism is phony that it's actually racist we think that to fight racism, one need only live the seven principles and keep an eye on the playbook of MLK. We exist to give congregations something that the UUA is no longer able to give them, namely support and common sense advice on the subject of fighting racism. And now, the benediction from Lincoln's first inaugural address. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, 
it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and every patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over the broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Well, shall we just proceed to our discussion? Mm -hmm. If people don't want what they have to say to be recorded, uh, if you just say so first, uh, I'll pause the recording and then what you say won't be recorded. Well, I, I can offer one little tidbit. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to make sure that this, my part of the service didn't run over, but uh, there is a little bit of detail related to that uh, clip from Casablanca I showed, which is uh, the song that the Germans are singing is Die Wacht am Rhein, The Watch on the Rhine. And it speaks, it comes from the fact that um, for some 200 years from the reign of Louis XIV right up into the 1840s, uh, the western, the eastern edge of Germany was constantly being invaded by France, which wanted that, that part of the Rhineland for themselves. And they said, keep a watch and we will defend the Rhine. But the song <laughs> that, that La Marseillaise is actually, um, that's not the actual title. Of, that the song was written under, it's called War Song for the Army of the Rhine, because, because the French were also saying the Germans have invaded us. <laughs> and, and that goes back to the French Revolution when the monarchies said, we gotta, we gotta keep this thing democracy from spreading. So you have two songs warring, each claiming a defense of their homeland, except, well, what we saw in that clip was uh, in this case, uh, uh, the La Marcias was speaking to our values and the, the German song was being misused. I, I, I find that uh, detail quite, in, quite interesting. Two hands are up. Hi, I think that was uh, very interesting um, about the, the Marcia and the other song. That's not why I raised my hand. I raised my hand to invite everyone to a town hall discussion on the four amendments to the Article 2 proposal. Uh, this is going to be Wednesday, March 27th, uh, next week at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and you can register for that at uutheconversation.org. And I'm going to be moderator and the sponsors of those four amendments are going to be explaining their amendments to us. So I think it would be a very interesting evening. Thanks. David? Yes, uh, I think Matthew have brought up interesting topic about wars, particularly in, in Europe. And I, my perspective is one of, I think you'd almost call it sour grapes, but I was stationed in Nuremberg, Germany, which is northern Bavaria in 71-72. Uh, and I had vaguely heard, I think it was Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, they tried to do a revolution like five years earlier, whatever, and, and nobody came to their aid. But we were told in our part of um, uh, Bavaria, that would be close to the Czech border, that if the Russians ever came over and, and attacked Germany, you know, we would be a blocking force, but we would be pretty much wiped out. And then reinforcements would come and try to push the, the uh, Russians back. But at the time, as a soldier there, I didn't feel very appreciated by the Germans. They viewed us 
as occupation groups. And uh, they kept uh, deliberately a church that was bombed out. Uh, they kept that there to show, to say, look what, look what they, those people did to us. They bombed our churches. And so it, it's not a healthy way to think, but I'm going to say it. It's like, I wondered if the Germans wish we had all our troops over there like we did when I was there about 50 years ago, because we had about a half a million troops there. And, and I think Russia was kept more at bay. Now, as you may know, a lot of the uh, armed forces U.S. have withdrawn. We don't have the draft anymore. So we don't have an imposing force like we did. And I wondered, you know, what, if you ask a German what they would think about it these days. That's it. Mm -hmm. Dick? Yeah, I think, you know, these days is totally different than... Uh, <clears throat> You know, World War Two. You have to consider the whole issue of nuclear powers, for example, and no one's going to do a, a really big war that's going to risk a nuclear war on the on either side. And and uh, Putin is not out there to uh, conquer Europe or to impose uh, authoritarian government. You know, he's authoritarian. He's never stated that, nor, nor does he have any prospects of that. Uh, so you have to look at what's really. Going on, as far as I can see, is this is that the the old old historical kind of uh, in this case Cold War mentality is still there that the Russians don't trust the West and West doesn't trust the Russians and uh, many of us think that if we'd had someone like Bernie Sanders as president instead of Joe Biden and uh, with Victoria Newland and then neocons or things that they could have found a, a, a compromise because the Russians under Putin, and there's a lot of history behind this, uh, you know, they, they view NATO as a threat to them, just as a lot of people in Eastern Europe view Russia as a threat. So when you have this kind of mutual history of threats, uh, to many of us, that's a better opportunity for negotiations and finding some reasonable compromise rather than demonizing one side or the other. Because there's, there's, there's again, a really deep history. It goes way back hundreds of years between Eastern and Western Europe and all those different things. And uh, I, think, I, think the States, I think the United States really kind of blew it after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a real chance for prosperity and democracy, bringing the former Soviet Union in as a friend of the West. And Putin himself said he wanted to be actually part of NATO at one point. And basically, we just turned him down. Instead of like after World War II, we decided to become the friends with our enemies, the Germans and um, the Japanese. We did not do that after the end of the Cold War. We lost a huge opportunity. We bequeathed them uh, an economy that was just, uh, they said, you know, bring in capitalism with no controls and just destroyed their economy. Um, I think we have to learn from history and say this this whole thing has been handled very badly. Mike? Thanks, Richard, and thanks, Matt, for a great talk. I think I told you before that FDR was always my favorite president and still is and probably always will be. And and I'm a uh, big fan of Lincoln as well. And then thank you, Richard, for bringing up my other heroes. Matter of fact, I'm looking at a, on my opposite wall up here. I'm looking at a picture of each of them. And I'm looking at MLK right next to FDR. So thank you for bringing him up, Richard. And But I, I like the gist of your talk. And I, I had never really thought about that. I knew it or I'd forgotten it, Matt. But how, how Lincoln when he was running and when he was, you know, the first few years in office and even in the 1850s, he was kind of, he was keeping the more extreme abolitionists at arm's length and said, no, we can't go too far too fast to end this slavery thing. And, and he was absolutely right. And I was reminded uh, just 30 years ago when I was still on active duty in the Navy that when Bill Clinton first came into office back in the early 90s, and I was less than a year away from retirement then, where 
Um, he instituted, well, it, actually, Colin Powell was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at that time. Bill Clinton was the brand new president. And, and Clinton wanted to go where um, gay people were allowed to serve in the military openly. And Colin Powell said, there's no way on God's green earth that that will ever work. There has to be a middle ground there because, because Clinton was thinking about turning probably the most homophobic U.S. institution in the country into all of a sudden, you know, allowing gay people to openly serve. He said there has to be a middle ground. And Clinton told Powell, he says, OK, General, come up with a middle ground. And that was basically Powell's idea, the, the don't ask, don't tell policy. And and uh, although he, he let Bill Clinton take credit for it, you know, as any good general that's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs would let the new president take credit for it. <laughs> and so he wisely did that. But that's what I said, oh, yeah, that's it was the same kind of thing. Sometimes moderation is the best way forward, I guess, is my whole point. And extremism, mm -hmm. extremism often is not a good idea. But anyway, thanks for being here and thanks for, for having me. Espen. Matt, it was a lovely um, sermon. Very good. Um, you know, it, it brings up the, the the trajectory we are in this country. We are in another era of um, tension. You know, there have been three tensions um, in this. We're in the third one. The first, you know, big tension was the Civil War where we, you know, we're trying to we – were, America was a young teenager at that time. Then World War II, America was was trying to be a mature adult and show the world – what we were made of and now right now it's every country is you know just as respectable but, but getting old and and you know realizing that you know there's not really much to fight over anymore but but land and space because everyone's got everything so it's a it, it, it but we need to appeal to this better nature i i, I think that's what what we've, we've got to do i mean i often don't don't know we see eye to eye with with certain liberal policies that I feel are a little too moderate but I think that in this day and age I think it's you know fundamentals are necessary and I think that in the also to respond to David uh, to David uh, Wilcom's response on Germany actually recently did a um a referendum they're trying to at the Senate level to get all the troops out because the German uh, parliament Senate feels that right now in order for Germany to truly sh uh, truly be a respectable nation and show that the world has learned from World War II that G America needs to withdraw all troops from the country because Germany now needs to be responsible and and say that it's our sovereignty and that we need to respect. And I think that's a one of my positions I think that right now we're in a in a little you know you know t um fight within the world and i think it's all over the fact that no one really wants to respect each other's sovereignty and we're all squabbling and i think that that's a that's the thing sometimes you got to let you know sleeping dogs lie and and hope it doesn't back blow back on you mm -hmm. does that put me up now sure if you want to be up well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I feel I need to respond to a former speaker. Uh, um, we should be careful how we use the word we when talking about this country. Um, you know, governments change, as I recall, after the fall of the Soviet Union. It, it was uh, George H.W. Bush as president, who rather than employ a new Marshall Plan, say, in the former Soviet Union, turned it over to vulture capitalism. Now, I tried to leave politi today's politics out of my talk, but as far as I'm concerned, Ukraine today is what is under attack just as Britain was in 1940, and they need a current arsenal of democracy to keep their democratic government uh, intact when it is being in, under threat uh, 
takeover and annexation by Putin's Russia, and that's not and that's not a democratic country, and um, that um, I think very much Joe Biden is following uh, Lincoln's playbook, building an incredibly broad coalition across party lines. I mean, the coalition resisting the current um, illiberalism in government expands from Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger on the conservative right to uh, Democrats like, like Eric Swalwell and, and my favorite now, Jasmine Crockett of Texas. If you haven't heard her, her rhetoric, it's wonderful. He's got them all pulling in the same direction, which is to preserve democracy first and put off these other squabbles later. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, what's better than protest and speaking truth to power is getting the power and using it wisely. And the wise use of power is exactly what Unitarian Universalism teaches, at least if we keep our seven principles. Thank you. Um, I should just say that uh, if no one else has a burning desire to speak, I did have teed up a song I could play for you, uh, which kind of sums up today's theme. It's by the Weavers. It's called Wasn't That a Time? I don't know if people are familiar with this song from, from uh, the folk singing days. If you want to hear it, I can play it. If not, we can just sign off. That's fine, too. I see a hand raised by Beverly. Is that a yes? I see a couple of nodding heads. I um, want to hear it, Matthew. Okay. Well, let's see what I can do for y'all. Um, let's let's hope. It, and again, this is not a recording. This is actually me <laughs> playing it. Oh, there it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yep. All right. Let me get my guitar out here. I tried to find a, a recording of the Weavers themselves doing it, but they kept ch uh, adding and dropping verses. And um, so I like these four verses that I'm going to sing now um, because it, it actually recapitulates the stuff that I talked about earlier. Our fathers bled at Valley Forge the snow was red with blood, their faith was warm. At Valley Forge their faith was brotherhood. Wasn't that a time? Wasn't that a time, a time to try? The soul of man, wasn't that a terrible time? Brave men who died at Gettysburg lie in soldiers grave but there they stem the slavery tide and there the faith was saved wasn't that a time wasn't that a time a time to try the soul of man wasn't that a terrible time the fascists came with chains and war and us in hate and many a good man fought and died to save the stricken faith wasn't that a time wasn't that a time a time to try the soul of man wasn't that a terrible time sorry our faith cries out we have no fear Dare to reach our hand to other neighbors far and near to friends in every land. Isn't this a time? Isn't this a time, a time to free? The soul of man, isn't this a wonderful time? Isn't this a wonderful time? Bravissimo, my friend, bravissimo.
Anyone else have a song they want to offer? <laughs> There's so many good ones out there. <laughs> well, the after party's at my house tonight. You're all welcome. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Good night, everyone. Be safe. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming.